Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for uh, being here. Uh, for those of you who are visitors to the law school, uh, welcome to the IU Mauer School of Law. We are uh, honored today to host this argument before the Indiana Court of Appeals. Uh, we have the opportunity to do this uh, every year or uh, two, one court or the other, and it's a really a great privilege and it's a great opportunity for uh, all IU students and members of the community to actually see our courts in action. Before this room uh, formally turns into the Indiana Court of Appeals, uh, I'd like to thank the judges uh, who are um, waiting right outside for moving their court to Bloomington. Uh, and I'd like to thank as well the court staff. Uh, I'd like to thank counsel. Um, this takes an exceptional effort, we know, for everyone involved to make this uh, opportunity available for our uh, students. Uh, let me start by introducing the attorneys representing the appellant is Nick Otis, who practices at Newby, Lewis, Kaminsky, and Jones, LLP, in LaPorte, Indiana. And from the Indiana Attorney General's office representing the state is Justin Robel, and he is accompanied by Nicholas Borf, who is the elected Stark County prosecutor. And uh, welcome to both of you, and uh, Mr. Borf in particular, thank you for uh, being here today. Uh, those of you who are in my appellate advocacy class have heard or, or will get a chance to hear me tell you a little bit about the judges, so I won't uh, go on about that as length because they are waiting, but they are all uh, experienced uh, judges whom we're lucky to have, um, both uh, Judge Baker, who served for many years here in Monroe County, uh, and Judge Mathias, who is from Allen County, uh, had lengthy terms at the state trial courts before moving to the Court of Appeals. Uh, Judge May, who is from Evansville, served for many years in private practice in uh, Evansville before uh, joining the bench. Uh, let's see. Uh, I, and I also mentioned thanks to the court staff. I should also mention um, state troopers who are here today taking care of security and members of the IU Police Department who are assisting with that as well and all the other communications uh, staff and people who made this possible. Because this is now from this moment on an official courtroom of the state of Indiana in the Indiana Court of Appeals, uh, I'd like you to remember courtroom decorum. First of all, would everyone please right now check your cell phone, make sure that your cell phone is turned off. Please be sure to put away and keep put away for the duration of the argument any other electronic devices such as laptops, telephones, anything of that nature. If your watches have an alarm, please make sure that your watch is silenced um, as well. If you do need to leave the courtroom, we hope you'll be able to stay for the duration of the arguments. Um, but if you do need to leave, please do so if possible at the conclusion of or in between the arguments rather than whether any advocate is uh, speaking. There will be time for questions after the arguments themselves are over. If you do have to leave because of a class or something like that, there will be a brief pause after the arguments before question and answer and that would be a, an opportune time for um, people to leave as well. So thanks again for being here and I'm now going to uh, turn the room over to the court. Good afternoon. This is a cause entitled Robert Corbin against the state of Indiana, an appeal from the Stark Circuit Court. The court recognizes Mr. Nicholas Oates, Otis, who is reserved five minutes. Is that correct, sir? Yes, Your Honor. And Justin Robel and Nick Bura uh, for the government. 
Um, you are ready to proceed? Yes, sir. Very well. Sir, you may be heard. Normally, we would ask questions about now, but because we're in a different environment, I'm going to ask you to give a little background as to how we got here. Sure. Thank you, Your Honor. And may it please the court. My name is Nicholas Otis, and on behalf of the defendant appellant, we are here today on April 3rd, 2013. The state of uh, Indiana, through the Stark County Prosecutor's Office, filed a two-count charging information alleging that on two consecutive dates in March, uh, March 21st, March 22nd of 2012, Robert Corbin engaged in online uh, communications with a 16-year-old identified as AH in the charging information, specifically alleging that Mr. Corbin knowingly or intentionally attempted to engage in fondling or touching with the intent to arouse or satisfy the sexual desires of either the child or the adult when Mr. Corbin sent Facebook messages to AH, a 16-year-old, asking her to physically take care of it because he was sexually aroused and he took a substantial step towards the, the crime by asking her to sneak out of her house and he would pick her up. And Mr. Corbin admitted to being sexually aroused by the messages. That was, that was the first, uh, on March 21st, that was the first count. The second count being on March 22nd, substantially the same allegations. Uh, Mr. Corbin sent Facebook messages to the student asking her to send him a kiss photograph and asking her what size her breasts were. He admitted to being sexually aroused and asked her to sneak out of the house. Uh, we filed a motion to dismiss within a week of the charging information. We had uh, a hearing before the Stark County Court in June of 2012. In August of 2012, the uh, judge denied our motion to dismiss and we requested from the trial court an interlocutory appeal, which the trial court granted, and that's what's brought us here today. For purposes of uh, reviewing a motion to dismiss a charging information, we assume is true all the facts in the charging information. Later on, if we get to trial, we may, we may allege that those facts aren't in fact true, but for the purposes of what we're here today, we assume is true all these facts in the charging information. And the purpose for which we filed the motion to dismiss is that we allege, or argue rather, that the charging information, the facts alleged in that charging information, even if proven all true, do not constitute the offense of attempted child seduction. And I, that, that brings us then to what is child seduction. The Indiana uh, legislature has defined it as uh, a person who is at least 18 years of age and the is a child care worker for a child at least 16 years of age, but less than 18 years of age, engages with the child in sexual intercourse, deviant sexual conduct, or any fondling or touching with the intent to arouse or satisfy the sexual desires of either the child or the adult, the, the, per excuse me, the person commits child seduction. We don't dispute here that, that my client was a child care worker. That's been alleged. We don't have an issue with that. We don't have an issue with the ages. What we take issue with today is the, that the state has alleged that my client attempted to engage in fondling or touching with the intent to arouse or satisfy the sexual desires of either the child or the adult. What is attempted fondling or touching? Well, Your Honor, there, there are about four cases that, that have discussed attempted fondling or touching. And the attempt statute, as defined at the time that this crime was uh, allegedly committed, a person attempts to commit a crime when acting with the culpability required for the commission of the crime he engages in conduct that constitutes a substantial step towards the commission of the crime. Is it your position that a Facebook message can never be a substantial step? No, I, I don't think never. I think the, the, the issue uh, is, is one of proximity, and I think depending on a certain set of facts, a Facebook message could potentially uh, lead towards the crime of, of child seduction, uh, but not in this circumstance, especially when he there was never any step to actually meet up with her. He never drove to her location, and I think that was addressed in State v. Kemp, uh, that in State v. Kemp, the defendant drove to the location with condoms after having very similar converse, online conversations, and this court, and I, I, I'm not gonna try to, especially since two of the judges sitting here today were involved in that decision, uh, found that that was not a substantial step towards the crime of child molestation, which is a very similar crime that we have here. Well, that's, a, that's an inter interesting question. Are we, as a separate panel of the court, bound by another decision of our court? I, I think absolutely. I, I think that the court needs to look at that opinion very closely, because I think it's nearly on all fours with the, with the facts that we have here. In fact, 
I think our case isn't even on all fours because my client didn't drive to the location to even attempt to pick this this girl up. It was online communication, uh, and um, there are steps in the process. Your position is that you're further back. Correct. The, I, I, that what this court said in Kemp was the, that all that Kemp's actions were were mere preparation or planning. And I, what Mr. Corbin did, whether you think it's morally right or wrong was just mere preparation or planning. It is not yet a crime in Indiana to be a CAD. Otherwise, you would plead him guilty, okay? But so, but it, 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 the way I read the statute is, um, we used to have the term in common law, assault was an attempted battery. I assume that fondling or touching in this way is a, a rude, insolent, or angry touching, it's a certainly a rude touching. Sure. So I assume that what your argument is, that to have an attempted fondling, you have to have an attempted battery. Correct, correct. And uh, just to be clear, in researching this, I began to wonder, well, could it, could it be an attempt if he only fondled or touched himself? And the Supreme Court, very clearly in Bond v. State, 1987, said that child molesting statute contemplates physical contact between the adult and child. So I very clearly the attempt had to be that he attempted to fondle or touch her. I don't know that necessarily had to be in a rude or angry manner. No, no, uh, no. That's, that's what we used to call the old one. Sure. This is rude. Sure. But the, the argument is that he never even got close to fondling or touching. He never left his house. There's no allegation of that at least. Uh, and regardless of whether he's five miles away, one mile away, ten miles, a hundred miles, he never took that next step. And by the way, in Kemp, the court said that that next step wasn't even enough. So the, the four cases that are on point on well, this. Let's, let's talk about the step then, because uh, you're correct. Several of us were on Kemp. And uh, I guess my thought is, uh, you know, I guess I'd like to differentiate between the two so we understand where along the spectrum we are on substantial step. We know what he did. What would it have taken, in your mind, to be a substantial step here? Sure. Well, the, the, there are no reported decisions where it was just online communication. We have State v. Camp where there was online communication plus individual drove to the location. Then we have uh, Benson, which we cited. We have Ward, which they're involved in State v. Ward, Indiana Supreme Court case. There were two, in fact, two communications with two different uh, uh, children. Uh, the first communication occurred when the individuals were talking to each other, feet from each other, and the individual asked, uh, the adult individual asked the child to perform a sex act on him, and the Indiana Supreme Court said that that was a substantial step. Later that same day, a sheriff sent a 15-year-old to go talk to, to the defendant. The defendant said, well, you know, if you're around the area sometime in the future, it, why don't you contact me and we can perform sex acts together? Indiana Supreme Court said, not, en not enough there. That's, that's like the old law school case where if this were not a size time, I would run you through. It's, you know, it's a future. Correct, correct. And that's, and that's exactly what the Ward, the Ward case said. It identified a three-step test. But let, let me step back and ask my question more directly. What would it have taken here to be a substantial yeah. step? Getting into the car? Picking her up? What, help me here. I, if you, the, the, you wouldn't be here arguing sure. this case if this had happened. The, court, the ward says you have to have the immediate capacity to commit the crime. And the crime here is fondling or touching while aroused, sexually aroused. So he had to be in the immediate, he had to have the immediate ability to commit, to fondle or touch this 16-year-old. Uh, so he so would have to be in proximity. That, that is our argument. While, the, while none of the cases explicitly say physical proximity, implicit in all those cases is the requirement of physical proximity. Well, if you're going to fondle, or attempt to fondle somebody, I mean, if, if it's going to be an assault, it cannot be an assault that I swing at uh, the television because I don't like the Raiders. Correct. Or if 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 I if if I punched the judge, I couldn't be charged with murder. That's not the, that that's not the fact. But, but, yeah. but it is. But I think your point is that if if you, uh, you I think you played basketball, at Belmont. So you, uh, if you cursed your opponent who was on the television and said. I'm going to get him, and you did that. 
you, you're not in proximity to, to have hit him. To, exactly, it's the it's the same the, the same concept almost as an attempted battery as it would be because there has to be a touching here. So 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 even if he would have had his computer and wireless sitting out in the car in front of the house doing the Facebook messages, is that enough? No, I, in my opinion, no, because he's not in the phys again the physical proximity of the girl to so fondle or touch within, her. Within touching distance. I, yeah, that's, th th that's what the cases seem to suggest. Uh, Ward, Benson, Shahan all, all involved people in the physical proximity. Shahan involved a father in, in his trailer, and he made a sex request to his daughter. Uh, court said that that, was, that request was enough. They were in the physical proximity. So is there any limit to what one person can say to another online? Would it ever cross that line? For for this child seduction statute, I don't think so. And, and that's it. that was the second part of our argument in our brief, was that the Indiana legislature has defined, I believe, 13 separate sex crimes. So I think it's very clear the Indiana legislature has thought this through about what is and isn't a crime. And had my client made the same exact comment to a 15-year-old that meet the exact definition of child solicitation, we wouldn't be here. We'd be working on a plea agreement because the, that those statements alone meet the definition of child solicitation. We do have a crime to meet this type of behavior under some circumstances. When, when the age of the child is, is below 16, is what the, the child solicitation statute says. And that's an important distinction here, 15 it, and 16. Th that, that, well, at least according to our Indiana legislature, they've decided that this, that, that same child solicitation, if, you, if it's a 16-year-old, not a crime. If, it, if it's under 16, it's, a, it's a, I believe, a C felony. So, uh, and interestingly, uh, the Indiana legislature has redefined uh, effective next July the definition of attempt for child sex crimes, and they've included it, the requirement is that the person engages in conduct that constitutes a substantial step if the person with the intent to commit a sex crime against a child or an individual the person believes to be a child communicates with the child or individual the person believes to be a child concerning the sex crime and travels to another location to meet the child or individual the person believes to be a child. In other words, a Kemp amendment. Yes, yes. And again, Kemp was... It's you, happened before and yes. it's going to happen Yes, and, and I, I think that, that uh, th this court was concerned in Kemp about uh, the, the facts at the time and, and what the legislature had defined as a crime, and I think the legislature responded. Uh, again, Kemp was dealing with a slightly different statute, child molestation, but uh, still similar facts uh, to, to child uh, seduction here. The, the state failed to cite in their uh, re uh, re reply brief any case that has ever held that a defendant has been guilty of attempted child seduction when the, when the defendant never left the home or never left the premises to me. So you failed to cite, is that because there aren't any, or they it, just didn't I, want to I find I did a, a, quite a bit of research, and I couldn't find any in Indiana. Uh, I couldn't find any in other states defining it either, so. This is a relatively new statute, is it not? I, I don't know when, when the statute came into effect. Uh, it, I guess relativity. relativity with time depends a lot on your age. Sure, it? and, and, and. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> Well, real careful. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 these are all new issues, and, and all of them are brought on because of the internet. So, I mean, it, it, these are issues that really can only be defined within the last 20 years or so. So, uh, it, it, it's an evolving issue, but I, I think very clearly the Indiana legislature decided not to make this a crime, and, and it, or forgot to, or forgot to. But that's not that, that, that that's not our issue not here today. Problem. I mean, if 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 individuals have an issue with that, they need to call the the Indiana legislature, not not come to the court. So, uh, I will uh, reserve my remaining time for rebuttal. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Council. May it please the court. To overcome the trial court's denial of his motion to dismiss charges, Mr. Corbin is asking this panel to adopt a bright line rule that to commit a sex crime by soliciting, the sexual act must be made, uh, the solicitation must be made in the presence of the intended victim. Right. What was the uh, charge here? It was uh, attempted child seduction. Not child solicitation. Uh, well, but. Well, wait, wait, wait. Correct. Oh, good. But my, my point is the. 
all of our arguments in our briefs deal with the 1988 Ward versus State opinion, where that court set out the test to how to attempt a sexual crime through solicitation. And that's been applied um, five times total, including in Ward, four times since then. And so I think those are the cases we have to look at that three-step test. The first step, solicitation takes the form of an urging. Second, it urges the commission of crime at some immediate time and not in the future. And three, the cooperation of submission of the person solicited is the essential feature. How do you get past number two? How do you get past in the, in the, the immediacy when we're talking about online and physically far apart? And, and that is the question in this case, I think, is whether or not this was immediate. And we have basically four cases that look at that. There's a ward where some time in the future is not enough. Uh, there's Mettler, which is a case where a father left a note on his uh, daughter's bed basically asking for a sexual act with half a $50 bill, come to my room some night and uh, I'll give you the that other half. That was in a trailer? Uh, I, I do not believe it was in a trailer. Okay. He was talking about a different case. Okay, but are, are we talking about a home? We're talking about a home. Okay, in which a child could rightfully feel sort of confined. And, you know, it, it's, it, to me, again, help me get past the fact that she didn't get into the car with this guy. Well, it, it, it's, in that case, they found that it was not immediate because in that case, the letter said so some night. it's even night. worse for the state. Well, it's, I don't think it is because I think, uh, A, it was some night, again, not concrete. Ward was not concrete sometime in the future. So in here we're talking, I, I think it's worth looking at what the trial judge found here because uh, no, it's abuse we, of we, discretion. We, look at, we do this de novo, don't we? It's an abuse of discretion standard on a... Uh, it's a question of law. No facts whatsoever are found, right? Um, well, there are facts in the, in the allegations, and the court can look at the probable cause affidavit, and so there, there is a, there's not really a fact finding. You're right. Be, uh, good. Um, it, it's a, it's, this is a traditional motion to dismiss. We look at the charging document, and we look at the law. That's and all. you look at the probable cause affidavit according well, to the Well, and we cases. assume everything in the charging document's true. True. Correct. Okay. But in that, but I still think it's useful to see what when, the trial judge. When, when was she supposed to do this? What day was it that she was supposed to show up and physically take care of it? What was that? Was that on a Tuesday? It was March twenty first, uh, two thousand twelve. Oh, I, the day of the it week. was supposed to be, happen that day. That's what from what we have in the probable cause affidavit. There was the email that he was presently aroused and wanted her to take when her parents fall asleep, sneak out and take well, care that, of his present. So arousal. that is in the future because the parents are presumably still awake. Well, it's not some time like in Kep, uh, Mettler or in Ward, so there, it's some immediate time. Tomorrow. And I think the uh, Mettler Later today. dissent uh, written by Judge May is kind of useful on that too, where her problem with the majority in that case was that it was clear that the some night could have been that night, and she found that should be immediate enough, that there was an immediate threat on the child. and that if I knew that case sounded familiar. And, and if you interpret it in a way where basically what they're asking where there has to be an in the presence request. You know, the harm has already happened to the child. They've already been forced to either uh, succumb to this solicitation or to rebuff the solicitation. And a big part of the war test was the second prong where you look at the type of crime, in that case child molestation, but this is also a child sex crime, where you want to be able to avoid the harm to the child. It's an important enough case that you want to put the substantial. The government could pass a law that just says if you if you talk nasty or dirty to kids that are under a certain age, that's a crime. That Could they true. not? That's true. But they didn't, did they? They did not, but since 1988, we've had this uh, ward test, which it's some immediate time. So it's not immediate, immediate. There is some wiggle room. Yeah, some but isn't our problem with ward is it, that it really was a pre-internet case that we didn't have Facebook? We didn't have, you know, email, texting, Twitter. It, it, there is times out there like that. I'm talking, let me just announce to you <laughs> in the clock. Well, I, I don't know if that's true because there still was telephone conversations, which would create the exact same scenario as we have here if a teacher was talking to a student. Well, would a telephone conversation fit under Ward? Um, it, it could be. It's, if Help me understand that. When, you know, Ward really t spoke, spoke directly to the immediacy factor. Physical immediacy. It doesn't say physical immediacy anywhere in the opinion. It says some immediate time and not in the future. And so whether or not that requires them to be in the Where same room. Where was this man in ward? Well, there was two men. 
Uh, the first one, they were on the street in the public in downtown Greentown, Indiana. So it was pretty clear a sexual act was not going to happen there, even though the request was made in the person uh, face to face. So the, it wasn't an immediate act even in that case. No, they're not going to do the sexual act in the middle of the street in Greentown, Indiana. The second person was the person, hopefully. <laughs> uh, we went by Don't go we, too far on that. <laughs> The second person was the campus. Okay, go ahead. Uh, sometime in the future, the non-concrete, in which not being concrete was what the majority in Mettler was very bothered by. And the defendants make a big deal about how there are no cases where they have not been in physical presence, but we have such a small group of cases here. So I think well, it's... Well, should we outlaw, should, should we read this statute to outlaw communication over the internet to make that any any conver any conversation any contact over the internet is immediate. Um, I, I don't think there's anything in the uh, you child should, seduction statute that suggests that. Because you can that. imagine that you have somebody that's sending that message that's in New York, and the recipients in Indianapolis or Los Angeles, and that's hardly immediate, is it? Right. And the ward, it looks at the commission of the crime at some immediate time is the language. So a situation like that where they are in different states and they're not going to be meeting up in any what very is, soon. What is the attempt? What act is the attempt? The communication? Well, Ward sets out that all three steps together form the attempt. The communication, the ability to have it occur at some immediate time, and the ability of the uh, child who's hearing the communication to either accept or deny. And I, I think this uh, court's opinion in Kemp is uh, useful to understand this too, and, and not in the way that the uh, defendant argues, because he keeps relying on the child molestation analysis that this court did, but the substantial step for child molestation was never alleged to be solicitation. The substantial step for that was only alleged to be going to the scene, and this uh, court found that that was mere preparation. Whereas there was a separate charge, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Uh, well, if, if that, if actually going to the scene was mere preparation, here we don't even have that. How do, you, how do you get around that with your position? That Kemp doesn't create an in-the-presence requirement. It doesn't require you to go to the scene. It's a different way to prove that substantial step, that the solicitation alone under the ward analysis can be a substantial step. So then we get back to the state's position appears to be that Internet communication is always going to be the immediate uh, conduct that's necessary to be an attempt. Well, I, I don't think that's true. I think it would have to be some sort of solicitation either by phone or internet to meet at some relatively immediate time. Like if a teacher called a student and said, meet me in room 5, 12, and 5 minutes. You know, they're not in the presence. Can you make the distinction between the difference between solicitation? And I think the solicitation statute was a reaction to one of our previous cases where we said that wasn't attempted child molesting. They said, well, it might not be attempted child molesting, but we're going to make it a crime because it was solicitation. Can you make the differenti differentiation between solicitation and attempted seduction, well, which requires a fondling or uh, what's, what is it called? It's either a sex act, act or a or fondling. Fondling, fondling or touching. Or a sexual act. Is in there. And it's okay. basically just the very limited sex crimes against child statute for dealing with 16 and 17-year-olds because there are certain adults they're in a position of trust where, because of that, they cannot do a fondling or a sex act with a child. Teachers, counselors, army recruiters are specifically set out in the child seduction. But the child solicitation statute has been around for at least 25 years. And in fact, they talk about that in Ward, because in Ward, you would have had a very disparate uh, effect as far as the penal consequences had it been charged under child solicitation, which I believe that time was a misdemeanor. And that's basically what he did, was an act of solicitation. But because the state decided to charge it as attempted child molestation, the Class A felony, it's a much more serious crime. And the Supreme Court said that wasn't a problem. Am I, am I correct, though? Here, Mr. Corbin never even got into his car and drove over to her house. Correct. What we have here is about 63 pages worth of Facebook messages sent back and forth over a five-day period. I agree that Mr. Corbin may be a despicable character. What I'm suggesting to you, however, is that isn't this very, very close to Kemp in that in Kemp we found that driving over with condoms in the back of the car was not a substantial step. Here, Mr. Corbin didn't even get into the car. But 
Well, what's important to remember is the analysis is different because Kemp is looking at whether driving over there is a substantial step. Here we're asking the separate question of whether or not the solicitation is a substantial whether step. Whether or not using internet communications is a substantial step, which gets me back to, isn't that what the state's really saying here? Well, you can't use the internet for nasty purposes. No, not at all, Your Honor. Because as again I said, if they had not planned to meet in a somewhat immediate time, as soon as they fell asleep, there would have not been a crime here. Had they talked to just sex talk over Facebook and talked someday I would like to have sex with you, that would not be a crime. What became a crime was the solicitation that when your parents fall asleep, let me pick you up. Well, so let me some ask immediate you, let me time. Ask you this. Um, let's assume for the sake of argument that everything that we find in your favor on everything that you've argued. Tell me how count two is even a crime as it's described. Which Wanting to look at this girl's breast. Again, a despicable act, but under the statute as it is drafted, how is it even a crime? And they didn't bring that in their motion to dismiss or their appeal that argument, but I do or agree. Or they would have been a winner. I agree it's troubling. Okay. I, I agree that probably would not withstand review. Okay. That's a good concession to have made, sir. Well, and I think there's a lot of reasons why you're going to want to uh, criminalize uh, solicitations and why the legislature wanted to uh, criminalize solicitations that are not face-to-face, -face. because you're going to have situations where it is a plan to meet in a few minutes, uh, especially with teachers and counselors where they're not, wouldn't normally be but that again, alone. I understand, but again, was it in a few minutes? Did he even get into the car? It's not a situation of him dry, walking down the hall to room 221. Well, and that's what the trial court was looking at here. They found because he was talking about present arousal and need to take care of his present arousal that there was enough immediacy there, that we don't know whether or not it was hoping to meet in minutes or in an hour. But at some point, that can be a question of, of facts for the jury or the fact finder. And in fact, our Supreme Court has told us repeatedly that normally whether or not some, something is a substantial step is a question for a jury, but of course, if you get a factual scenario where it could not possibly be a substantial step, then it should be dealt with. But on interlocutory appeal, we're de novo anyways, correct? I mean, on this, with regard to the law, whether these in fact are crimes, we're de novo. Whether or not it's a crime, it's a no novo. That's correct. Yeah. Um, but, and I think it's important to, for example, the Supreme Court's recent case. Uh, Yo versus State from 2012 talks about how you look at that. And there they say that, A, you look at the probable cause affidavit, you look at whether or not different interpretations are possible. And if it's clear the legislature would have intended this to be criminalized, then that's how it should be well, interpreted. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. The, the legislature intended to criminalize this behavior. Don't we have due process requirements that, that this, the statute has to define in an understandable manner what, what constitutes criminal conduct? Well, our Supreme Court set out the standard for solicitation by uh, solicitation, and it's their interpretation of what a substantial step means in this context. So we're kind of a step away from the statute already. Uh, but I do think because that it's such well-established case law, and so far the only cases that I've found not to be a substantial step, not to be a uh, solicitation for something at an immediate time, are the cases where there was no concrete plan. I, I think th the defendant was on notice that he could be criminal liable, criminally liable for asking. Tell me again about, the, wasn't there a concrete plan in Kemp, but it still wasn't a substantial step? I mean, the guy actually drove to the place? And he was armed. This court specifically found there was no solicitation in Kemp, though. <laughs> so you can't look at the solicitation analysis. In the second part of your argument, you say, um, the, there's no evidence that Kemp ever urged the child to perform a sexual act. Kemp asked a number of sexually explicit questions and made a number of explicit comments. However, there is no allegation that Kemp urged Brittany for you to do anything. So I, I don't really see the application of Kemp here. It does not look well, at war. Tell me about Kemp and, and count two. He's, he's already conceded count two. Yeah, I, I don't think we get anywhere with count two because there was no request for either a sexual act or a fondling or touching in count two. <clears throat> in closing, the state requests that this court deny defendants' request for a bright line rule. The Supreme Court has already given us a controlling test in Ward. A jury can determine whether Mr. Corbin solicited AH for a sex act at some immediate time. If this court does create a bright line rule, we ask the court be mindful that Ward has broad application to other sex crime be mindful that the harm to children that would result from the state not being able to preemptively stop acts of child seduction and child molestation, and be mindful of the challenges created by this modern era of instant communication.
Thank you, sir. Thank you, judges. Mr. Otis, you have a few moments left if you choose to use them. <clears throat> The, the issue that I, I, I think the trial court got a little caught up on that I think in, that led to their incorrect, the trial court's incorrect conclusion is this whole issue of solicitation. And I, I, I think that Judge Matt, Matthias brought this up earlier about these communications that are alleged in this charging information, I, I'm not here to talk about whether they're, they're morally right or wrong. I, I, if they're true, they're wrong. What the issue is, is not about whether he f asked her to, to physically take care of it. The issue is whether he attempted to fondle or touch her. And he doesn't even get close to that. He, he never leaves the house. And so Kemp, uh, I, I think ultimately the court had two issues with, with, with Kemp. Uh, and it, it really stemmed from the two issues in Ward the, <laughs> of the three-pronged test. The first two that he really wasn't urging was one of the conclusions. And the second conclusion was that there, they didn't, he didn't intend to immediately commit the crime. So I, I, I think that Kemp is, is, is right on point. And in fact, if, if this court felt uncomfortable about Kemp, I think you have to really feel uncomfortable about Corbin. And if the, the state's bothered by that, they shouldn't be here, but they should be up in Indianapolis talking to their legislature about amending the statute. But as a matter of broader public policy, don't we have an obligation to the citizens of the state of Indiana to interpret these statutes in a way that clearly, I mean, this is pretty scummy conduct. And do, don't we have an obligation to, to interpret the statutes to, to take care of what clearly uh, any member of the General Assembly would, would want to have happen here? Well, I, I think the, the job of this court, and I, I'm not trying to tell the court what its job is, but Everybody I think- Everybody else does, <laughs> why shouldn't you? <laughs> The, the, jo the, the job of the, this court is to interpret what the legislature has defined as criminal conduct. And it specifically defined child solicitation if the, this exact conduct is a crime if the child was, was 15 or under. So the key is to go back to my argument with Mr. Robel, which is there are some due process problems here from your standpoint. We haven't raised due process, but I, I, I just think the issue is that the legislature, for better or worse, has decided that this is not criminal conduct if it's with a 16-year-old. You know, a, another issue that, that friends of mine ask that, who aren't lawyers, I, I've told them, if Mr. Corbin wasn't a child care worker and he did this with a 16-year-old, it's not a crime. It, you, he, could, he could have sex with a 16-year-old if, if he's not a child care worker, if he's not a teacher, if he's just somebody off the street that meets a 16-year-old, he could have sex with her or fondle or touch her, and it's not a crime. And I think most people would say that's a loophole in the statute. So the, the legislature often leaves loopholes, and it takes cases like this or the court to say, you know what, this isn't a crime, but maybe the legislature should go back and look at this statute and, and redefine child solicitation to include 16 or 17 year olds. But, but they haven't at this point. And so for that reason, we ask the court reverse the decision of the trial court and uh, grant our motion to dismiss. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> First, I'd like to caution the audience to take nothing from our questions. We do so in order to stimulate our discussions and to help us work through these issues. Normally at this time we would retire to discuss this cause and to assign to one of our colleagues the responsibility of trying to reflect in an opinion our decision. And at least one other person would have to join that. But because we find ourselves in this unique setting, we are going to make ourselves available to answer questions from the audience, not about this case or any of the issues that we have discussed. <laughs> we will talk about being lawyers or judges or whatever you want to talk about, but we're not going to talk about this case because we can't by the, our code of uh, judicial conduct, as you can probably uh, hopefully appreciate. So uh, as soon as the court is uh, adjourned, those of you that need to scurry elsewhere may scurry, and the rest of you, if you will stay, we'll, we'd love to visit with you. Mr. Bailey. All right. Have a seat.